Welcome back to Mr. Latham's AP Macroeconomics. We're going to wrap this up with Part C of the multiplier, which is the investment demand curve. This is relatively simple, but it'll be useful in a lot of what we do from here on out. Okay, first thing is describe the relationship between the real interest rate, expected rate of return, and investment. Okay, think about this. Okay, first of all, the real what is the real interest rate? Well, it's the, the nominal interest rate. In other words, you go to a bank and they say the interest rate's 5%. Well, you subtract from that inflation. Let's assume inflation's 2%. Well, you're not really earning 5% because inflation's going to decrease your purchasing power by 2%. So you're actually going to be 3% ahead of the game in a year, right? Earning 5%, inflation's 2%. So you're really only earning 3%. Okay, so think about the real interest rate being 3%. We're going to call that I sub R is 3%. Okay, now you're going to make an investment. Your investment, well, what return do you expect on your investment? When you invest in something, you expect it to make money for you. Well, we look at our investments in terms of rates of returns. Well, how high a rate of return do you want? Well, you want as high as possible, but what we know is if we can get 3% from a bank, we want higher than 3%. Or why would we invest in our business? We could just shove the money in a bank, let them pay us the 5%. We'll be 3% better off. We don't care anymore. So we know we want higher than 3%. So that's kind of the relationship between the real interest rate and our expected rate of return. And all we know is we want more than 3%. So what's that look like? Well, that's where the investment demand come the investment demand curve comes in on the y-axis it's going to be our expected rate of return okay we're going to just put rr but our expected rate of return and over here on our x-axis it's going to be the quantity of investment in dollar terms well Let's think about this, okay? In the real world, let's assume 20% rate of return is fantastic, okay? If you can get a 20% rate of return, remember, the real we can only earn 3% from the bank. If we could get 20%, we would be like, awesome, that's wonderful, I really want to do that. That's the good news. The bad news is we look around, the investments that pay 20% are zero. Okay, well, that didn't work out too well. What if we say, well, you know what? 15% is also very, very good. Can we have any investments that return 15%? And it turns out that's 5 billion. Well, put a little dot right there, 5 billion, 15%. You're like, well, 15% is really, really high. How about if we lower it to 10%, are there any investments? Can we get more than 5 billion? Okay, well, it turns out we can now get $10 billion. Okay, and so that goes right here. What about 5%? Well, that turns out to be $15 billion. And if we're willing to accept no return above this 3% that we're looking for, then we can go all the way to $20 billion. Okay, well, guess what we just created? Yes, it is. That's the investment demand curve. In other words, the lower the interest rates are, okay, at 15%, not a lot, as interest rates go lower, guess what happens to our investment? We can invest more. If that real rate of return drops to 2 or 1%, it'll, lessen, it'll let us in invest more, we'll be able to make we'll make more investments and help the economy more. So that's the investment demand curve in a nutshell. Okay, now what would cause the investment demand curve to change or shift? Well, there's a couple of basic things and just want to briefly talk about them. Okay, maintenance cost, right? You spend $100 million on a plant and it's going to cost you $20 million a year to maintain. Wow, that's a lot. Well, what if we could lower through some kind of technological improvement or something else, we could lower the, the expense from $20 million down to $5 million. 
then you'd invest more, right? You could spend, you're more likely to buy, to spend $100 million on that plant, or you could even spend more on the plant because your maintenance cost would be so low. So there's one example. Technology, okay? You were thinking about spending $100 million on a plant, and you're like, yeah, I don't know, that's really high, maybe we won't make our money. They come out with some new technology, and instead of spending $100 million, you only have to spend $75 million on the same plant. You're like, you know what, now our return's higher, it's better for us, now we're willing to spend more money, okay? So we're, we're going to spend, we're going to go ahead and spend the money. We're more likely to spend the money because we have improved technology. And the third is expectations, and I'm going to cover a whole gamut of things there, but you can think of we expect less, less competition. We expect more demand in our market. We expect the economy to get better. All kinds of different things that we believe are going to happen would cause us, or are actually happening, would cause us to believe we should go ahead and make this investment. And even though it doesn't have as quite as good a yield as, we, as we'd like to have, we think the yield is more sure, whatever. So all of these factors can shift that investment demand curve. And as you think of it, we were here, we're going to invest this much at this percent let's say that's 10 percent well if you can shift that demand curve outward okay well you're also going to invest more right remember this is your quantity invested your quantity of dollars invested and so if you can shift that curve out a 10 percent return will seem more attractive and you'll be good okay now number two describe the reasons for the instability in investment spending and We've talked about this before, but think about it, okay? Remember, here's the business cycle, right? Peaks and valleys. Well, when things are going good in here, businesses are like, yes, things are great. Let's invest. Well, when things start heading down in here, businesses are like, you know what? We don't have to build this plant. Why would we invest now? Let's wait. And why do we wait? Because it's postponable. Investments, even consumer durables, right, are postponable. And so you're less likely to make investments. Then the market picks back up, picks back up. Investments skyrocket again. So instead of this nice, like, kind of bendy curve that I showed you there, the investment curves look more like this. Okay? And that's instability. In the good times, lots of investments. In the bad times, very little investments, which causes more of this curve that you see the ups and the downs, right? The peaks and the troughs than you would see in consumption spending where you got to pay your rent and your utilities and you got to eat and all that good kind of stuff. So that's it. That's our last section on sp the spending multiplier and MPC and all. So we'll see you next time. Thanks.